Uh, Lieutenant Kenneth Rowlett with the Police Department and the Evening Shift Watch Commander, um, the department's uh, commander of the SWAT team, and also the range master for all firearms and use of force training for the department. My name is Steve Herring. I am assigned to Patrol Division with the Cardinal Police Department. I work evening shift 3 to 11. Uh, Lieutenant Rowlett is one of my lieutenants. Um, I'm currently on the SWAT team and a firearms instructor. Individuals must be prepared both mentally and physically to deal with an active shooter situation. <coughs> Question, how many of you guys have concealed permit carry? I know that there are certain places that y'all are now not allowed to carry them. And even though we live in Cairo, we like to think that the police will be there to drop of a hat. Um, a lot of times, civilians can take action and eliminate things. So I was just, I was just curious about that. I'm, I strongly support that. I'm glad to see a lot of show of hands. Uh, some statistics. <coughs> Uh, these are from 2002 and 2012. Most of your incidents are just violent crime. Uh, they make up 96% of all your active shooter situations. Uh, hate crimes such as Ku Klux Klan, um, small 2.6%. Then you have your terrorism, uh, domestic and international. Um, the locations, mainly in the workplace, 37%. Uh, school, business, uh, church home, uh, courthouses kind of following at the bottom there. But mainly they're in the workplace or a school type situation. Um, active shooter outcome. About half the time the suspect is arrested, commits suicide. Um, small part, small portion he's unidentified or killed by law enforcement. Um, the motivation, active shooters are so random, you can't really profile, they're hard to pick out. This guy, you know, he looks like an act active shooter, you just you really can't do it, they're, un they're unpredictable. Um, so 40% of them are unknown. 21% workplace retaliation, like the beginning of the video. Uh, academic retaliation, domestic, uh, hate crimes, or other. Once again, these are statistics from 2002 to 2012. <coughs> that just breaks it down a little better. Um, in the workplace, according to this graph, you were 55 to 58 incidents. Um, Negative <coughs> school or businesses. The majority, of, the majority of these active shooters are committing suicide. Um, 30 in the workplace. So these people are going in, they're wanting to put their name, they want to go out and blame the boy. Okay? Uh, once they start doing this, they have no intention of being arrested or going to jail. Uh, they're either going to shoot, they're going to fight till they run out of bullets, till they have no more victims, or they're killed by either civilian or law enforcement. They have no uh, intention of going to jail. It should be noted, negotiations are not an option either. That's yeah. something that you have to yeah. take into consideration. Unless it is possibly a domestic uh, relationship related incident, like a man looking for a, a, his wife or something that's a specific target and he's shooting whoever stands in the way, these folks, they're, they're, you cannot negotiate with them because their goal is to kill more people than what happened during the last incident. It's all about the numbers. So negotiations are not, a, are not an option. That's one reason that when, when we do this uh, presentation to, to churches, it's always a good idea for the pastor to get out as soon as he can because maybe he is the, the cause of that shooter coming in there. Maybe he has something against his pastor. So if he can get out, as soon as possible, you know, maybe it'll help um, the escalator. 96% um, of your active shooters are male, only 4% of them. 
Uh, there's another graph on the sums of victims killed or wounded from 2002 to 2012. And as you can see, I know there's a little bit of stepping stones in there, but it's going up. I wish we had the statistics with me for 2012 to the present. Just be curious what it is. But from 2002 to 2012, it's constantly getting increasing. Um, this is another graph on the victims by incident location type. Um, killed and wounded. Once again, workplace, school, and businesses. They're the three highest. How to respond when an active shooter is in your vicinity. Quickly determine the most reasonable way to protect your own life. Remember that customers and clients are likely to follow the lead of employees and managers during an active shooter situation. Evacuate. If there is an accessible escape path, attempt to evalu evalu evacuate the premises. Be sure to have an escape plan and route and plan in mind. Evacuate regardless of whether others agree to follow. If you're a store manager, or you're a church leader, or you're a, I'm only about a teacher for now, um, patrons or other people will tend to follow you, okay? You need to have some kind of evacuation plan in mind. Always know where your exits are. Um, know where restrooms are in case you can't get out. It's a place to hide up and can barricade the door and uh, offices and stuff. Um, you should always run when possible. That's the first priority is get out. Um, you may you may have people that are so frightened they don't want to run. Okay, if at all possible, you should try to help those people. But that being said, <clears throat> if you have four or five people that you're trying to get out, and there's one person he just won't come, you know, it's you need to get out. Okay, you need to save the majority. Okay, you need to attempt to to get that person to follow you. Now that being said, for teachers in school, you know, I hope they're not going to run out without kids. <laughs> but anyway, that's just it's, it's something to think about. Run is your first priority, and try to help as many people as possible. But don't let others slow you down and prevent you from escaping and you becoming a victim along with the people you're trying to get out. As well. as a uh, side, uh, as a side note on that, also be mindful if you do evacuate. You don't want to just exit the building and stop. You want to keep moving. Uh, that's something you want to look for some type of. We did this over at Town Hall last, uh, about two weeks ago, I think it was for some Town Hall employees. We said, you know, if you evacuate Town Hall, you don't just want to run out there in the back parking lot and already drop your water bill payment and stop. They may want to come on over here to the library or somewhere like that. You want to, you want to keep moving. And you also have to be mindful that there have been situations uh, Jonesboro was an example of this at uh, Westside, where they were on the exterior shooting. So you still, once you exit, still have to be uh, aware that you could have someone out in the lot or on the exterior trying to shoot as well. So you, that heightened sense of awareness needs to, to continue going until you've reached a, a safe place away from that location. Yeah, it's going to be outside of me, I really can't reach it. Um, Prevent individuals from entering an area where the active shooter may be. Let's say he's in this room and people run out this door. Well, say you've got people trying to come in here because they hear gunshots. You know, just try to keep people away from where you know that the shooting is taking place. Um, keep your hands visible. You may have law enforcement outside waiting to come in. Well, an active shooter is not going to have a shirt on that says, hey, it's me. He's going to look like anybody in this room. Okay. So you don't want to make any furtive movements or run with your hand in your pocket. You want to have your hands out. And follow the instructions a policeman may give, give you. During an active shooter, don't try to go back. Once you get out or help people out, don't try to go back in <coughs> and get the wounded. Okay, just don't do it. You, uh, you're going to put yourself at risk. Uh, plus, you may hinder law enforcement coming in. So just one, once once you're out, you're out good. And call 911 as soon as possible, whether you do it before you leave or once you're out. When it's safe, you need to call 911 as soon as possible. 
give them information. Tell them what you know or, or what you don't know. If you don't know anything, say, I don't know anything. I heard three shots, people screaming. You, know, you may have seen somebody shoot something. Any information you can give to our dispatch and they can relay to us is beneficial. Very. We may know we're looking for a white male, a black male, or whatever, white female, just anything. Not get out. <clears throat> Evacuation is not possible. Find a place to hide where the active shooter is less likely to find you. Your hiding place should be out of the active shooter's view. Provide protection if shots are fired in your direction. Example, an office with a closed locked door. Try to pick an area that does not trap or restrict your options for movement. That's ideal. Uh, you may not be able to, <coughs> to help that last one. Your, your, yours may be <coughs> an office in the back of the building with just one door. But if that's your only option, that, that's it. You need to get in there, barricade the door, lock it if possible, turn out the lights, just, uh, just like the video said. Silence your cell phone, be as quiet as possible. Huddle in a, in a corner. Not a corner that's away from the door, but one preferably on the same side as that door. There's just to prevent an active shooter from entering your hiding place, lock the door, blockade the door with heavy furniture. If the active shooter's nearby, lock the door, silence your cell phone or pager, turn off any source of noise, hide behind large items, remain quiet, the video mentioned concealment and cover. Uh, some of you may know what that is, some of you may not. Concealment will hide you, but it will not stop a bullet. Uh, Sheetrock will not stop a bullet. A bullet will go through there, but you are hidden. The active shooter does not know you're there. Cover is something that will stop a bullet. A big metal desk, a metal filing cabinet, uh, whatever it be, behind a piece of equipment is something that will stop a bullet. That's cover. That's the different difference in cover and concealment. Um, if evacuation and hiding out are not possible, remain calm. Dial 911. Alert the police of the active shooter's lo location. If you cannot speak, if I if I call 911 and all of a sudden somebody's trying to get in that door, the active shooter is. I don't want to be talking. But you can put your phone on speaker. And just let dispatch hear. You know, maybe they can determine what's going on or help anything to help us. But you do not want to give away your cover or your concealment. Um, usually, they move quickly. They uh, the active shooter will not spend time trying to get into a locked door. He's looking for victims. He's looking to put his name out there. He wants to kill or hurt as many people as as he can. So he won't spend time. But if he's provoked, if he can hear you in, in there talking, especially to 911, uh, he may try harder to get in that hiding place that you're at. So if you can hear somebody, just put your phone on speaker and just hold it up and let dispatch and listen to it. Um, if running is out, if hiding is out, you need to take action against the active shooter. As a last resort, and only when your life is in imminent danger, attempt to disrupt and or incapacitate the, active incapacitate the active shooter by acting as aggressively as possible against him or her, throwing items and improvised weapons, yelling, and committing to your actions. Once you make up your mind, I can't get out, I can't hide, you've got to defend yourself. You can look around anything, a chair, a table, a flagpole, whatever, a, a laptop. You want to use anything you can against that uh, active shooter, anything you can to, to stop it. <coughs> Once you make up your mind that that's what you're going to do, you have to commit to it. You can't hesitate. You've got to do it. Um, and it's always best if you've got another person with you same idea. Two's better than one. You know, he may he may get one of you. I don't know, but it's it's something you, you that you got to do. You got to get that. You got to defend yourself as best you can. Information to provide to law enforcement or 911 operators. The location of the active shooter. 
hey, I'm here, I'm at this address, I'm at the FedEx building, I'm at the library. A uh, number of shooters, I've seen two people, I've seen two males, I've seen one male. Physical description, number and type of weapons held by the shooter. He's got a rifle, he's got a pistol, you don't have to be specific, you know, he's got a AK-47 or he's got a Glock, just a handgun or a, or, or a rifle. Um, and if you know how many people have already been shot or wounded or hurt, anything like that is information that's good for us. Just try to pass on as much as you can. How to respond when law enforcement arrives. Law enforcement's purpose is to stop the active shooter as soon as possible. Officers will proceed directly to the area in which the last shots were heard. Our officers are, are taught if we're called and we're responding to an active shooter situation and we come in the front door, we may see people wounded, we may have people running out, okay? But if we hear gunshots, we're going straight to the gunshots. Because it does us no good to help people or stop and talk to people when an active shooter is actively killing or hurting other folks. We're going to go straight there. The ideal situation is four but hey, it may just be one, it, it may be two. Uh, but no officer's gonna stand by while somebody's shooting. So just when a, when a law enforcement officer arrives on the scene, just do not run up to him. The only way, the only reason I would say do that is if you had some information, some important, like hey, I, I know he's on the second floor, I just came from there, okay? But normally, do not run up to them, just go outside. There's, gonna, there's eventually gonna be other officers outside that you can talk to, but any, any officer that is entering that building or already in that building, just do not stop and talk to them. Keep your hands out, rub your head off, on your head, whatever. Um, this says that officers usually arrive in teams of four. That situation is ideal. Maybe one, maybe two, maybe more. It just depends on where it is and where the officers happen to be. Uh, they may wear regular patrol uniforms or external bulletproof vests, Kevlar helmets, other tactical equipment. They may be armed with rifles, shotguns, and handguns. All of our patrol patrolmen, they have handguns and shotguns. Um, several of our patrolmen are, have the rifle, rifles. Uh, they may use pepper spray or tear gas to control the situation. They may shout commands. They may push you to the ground or out of their way for safety. Just that's things to be aware of. Remain calm. Follow the instructions. Uh, put down any items in your hand, bags, jackets, etc. Anything that an officer may look at and say, "Hey, he can have a pistol in that bag." You know. Um, immediately raise your hands. Just let the let the policeman know. I don't have anything in, in my hands. I'm a good guy. Avoid making quick movements toward the officers. Uh, avoid pointing and screaming or yelling. There's already going to be enough of that. Uh, do not stop and ask officers for help or directions. Just proceed uh, with your evacuation plan. The first officers to arrive to the scene will not stop to help injured persons. Expect rescue teams comprised of additional officers and emergency medical personnel to follow the initial officers. The rescue teams will treat and remove any injured persons. They may also call upon able-bodied individuals to assist in removing wounded from the premises. Once that active shooter is taken care of, once the scene is secured, then we can deal with the wounded. But like I said earlier, we're not gonna stop and help people when we can hear shots being fired and other people are being killed. We've got to eliminate the threat first. Once you have reached a safe location or an assembly point, you will likely be held in that area by law enforcement until the situation is under control and all witnesses have been identified and questioned. Do not leave until law enforcement authorities have instructed you to do so. Once again, we're just trying to find out what happened. We're also trying to make sure the shooter is not trying to escape just claiming to be a victim. Preparing for and managing an active shooter situation. Reactions of managers during an active shooter. 
Employees and customers are likely to follow the lead of managers during an emergency situation. During an emergency, managers should be familiar with their emergency action plan and be prepared to take immediate action, <coughs> remain calm, lock and barricade doors, evacuate staff and customers via a pre-planned evacuation route to a safe area. If you're, if you're at Walmart shopping and an active shooter situation takes place, it's going to be chaos. Take it. Um, try to remain calm. Any managers, I don't know what you guys do, what your profession is. Uh, if you have people who work underneath you, uh, try to be a leader. Try to take some of the stuff you learned here, the run, hide, fight, um, stay calm. If if you're calm, people will gravitate towards that, and it will hopefully keep them calm. We just don't need mass chaos, people running around, screaming. Just try to be a leader and stay calm. Help as many people as you can. But like I said earlier, don't let them slow you down and get you and other folks killed. Recognizing potential workplace violence. An active shooter in your workplace may be a current or former employee or an acquaintance of a current or former employee. Intuitive managers and coworkers may notice characteristics of potentially violent behavior in an employee. Alert your human resource department if you believe an employee or coworker exhibits potentially violent behavior. Employees typically do not just snap but display indicators of potentially violent behavior over time. If these behaviors are recognized, they can often be managed and treated. Potentially violent behavior by an employee may indicate one or more of the following. This list of behaviors is not comprehensive, nor is it intended as a mechanism for diagnosing violent ten tendencies. Um, I'm not gonna read all of these. Uh, you guys can increase, um, use of alcohol, depression, withdrawal. <clears throat> Let's say that you work with Johnny. And Johnny's always been a, a fun guy. You know, he's always a jokester. He's a fun guy to work with. And over time, he comes to work. He hasn't shaved. You know, he just seems down. You know, Johnny may just be moonlighting. and he may have another job. And he's just tired. I don't, I don't know. Um, that's something you have to, it's just little characteristics to look for, traits you can look for in other people that you work with. Uh, their mood or personality changes, their physical appearance becomes disheveled. Um, you might want to let somebody know about it. You know, maybe somebody can talk to them and find out what's going on. Um, anything that will potentially stop. You know, he may, he may have it out for so-and-so and may be an active shooter. I don't know. Just these are characteristics that you can look for people in your workplace that you that you work with. Uh, hear more of them. Repeated violent uh, violations of policies. Like <coughs> I'm not going to read these all. Uh, increasingly, he talks of problems. Anything out of the ordinary that he hasn't that you've been working with this guy with this guy for years and he's never done that. Anything out of the ordinary that any un a custom behavior that you're used to seeing. There are five phases that an active shooter goes through. The first one is a fantasy stage. <clears throat> During this stage, the shooter has daydreams of shooting. He fantasizes about the news coverage. He idolizes other shooters. You know, he's looking up Columbine or Sandy Hook, just you know, reading about it, fantasizing about it. Um, he might draw pictures of, event, of the event and make web postings about it. Facebook, we're so socially we're connected now. Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Uh, Would-be active shooters in the fantasy stage will often discuss their desires with friends and foes alike. If news of these fantasies are shared with you, believe them and pass them on to law enforcement. If police can intervene prior to the suspect acting on their fantasy, there may never be a headline. Next is the planning stage. In this stage, the suspect is deciding on the who, what, when, where, and how of his day of infamy. He will put his plans down in writing. He will quite often discuss these plans with others and sometimes seek out an accomplice. 
He will plan the time and location to ensure the most victims, or in some cases, to start to target specific victims. He will determine the weapons he will need and where and how to get them. He will decide how to travel to the target area, how to dress to conceal the weapons without arousing suspicion. If the police are tipped during this stage, once again, intervention can be made prior to people dying and families crying. <coughs> Preparation stage. During this stage, the suspect may be obtaining gunpowder for his improvised explosive device. He might break into grandfather's house to steal some weapons or ammunition for the event. He might stockpile or preposition weapons and explosives for the assault. Active shooters have been known to call friends and tell them not to go to school or work on the day that they plan to uh, schedule the attack. If one of these friends calls the police about their concerns, the citizen's intervention may prevent multiple funerals. That kind of goes without saying, you know. Any, if you've got somebody talking to you, if you've got a friend, a coworker, whatever, talking to you, they sound crazy like this, they're, they're making all these plans that sound crazy to you, you need to tell somebody. The approach stage. This is a very dangerous stage. The suspect has made his plan and decided to act. He will be walking, driving, or riding toward his intended target, armed with his tools of death. Con <clears throat> contact with the soon-to-be active shooter could come in the form of a traffic stop, a citizen call, or a stop and frisk. A thorough investigation can still lead to an arrest of the suspect before he brings down a multitude of victims in a needless shooting and bombing. Uh, that number four right there, in a way that's kind of geared toward law enforcement, you know, let's say I stop somebody for speed or whatever, maybe he's got a dark window team, he runs a red light, and I'm up there and I'm, hey man, you know, we got an awful lot of guns. <laughs> um, you know, law enforcement can investigate farther and hopefully make an arrest and stop something. But the same goes for y'all. You know, your, your neighbor, you see him loading a bunch of guns into his truck or car. Something that just doesn't, you know, other than a planned hunting trip, something that just doesn't look right. <clears throat> Implementation stage. Once the shooter opens fire, immediate action needs to be taken. The active shooter will continue to kill until he runs out of victims or ammunition or is stopped. This suspect is unique because he is fully dedicated to going for the top score, with his measure, which is measured in kills. The sooner an on-duty or off-duty officer or citizen intervenes with an effective, efficient act of courage, the less casualties there will be. In past incidents, act active shooters have been thwarted by police officers, security guards, school teachers, and students. One principal recently died successfully stopping an active shooter in a Wisconsin school. There is a risk in doing something, but the greater risk lies So remember, just like the video, just like the PowerPoint, run, hide, fight. Those are the three things you should do in that order, if at all possible, in an active shooter. We thank you all for letting us come and talk to you. Do we have any questions, any discussion, anything? I want to hit real quick on uh, those of y'all that have concealed weapon permits to cover that. Uh, not to get political in any way, because that's not what this discussion is, but I agree with Steve. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm pro for that. Uh, do be mindful if you find yourself in an active shooter situation and you're armed and you decide that you want to take action against that shooter, you do still need to be mindful that law enforcement is going to be responding to that scene. And I, have, I remind myself of that as well. I carry a gun every five. 98% of the time, probably, I have a weapon on me because I feel it's my responsibility uh, to have a weapon on me. But if I'm not in this uniform and I'm off duty in plain clothes, let's say at Walmart, and there's a shooter, and I go confront that shooter, maybe I take him out or I'm holding him at gunpoint or something like that, I have to be mindful <coughs> that those on-duty officers that arrive, especially if I'm not inside my own jurisdiction, or if I'm, you know, Joe's citizen, they could think that you're the shooter. So that is something you have to be very mindful of. If you see law enforcement responding, getting on the scene, you probably want to go ahead and get that weapon holstered. 
because there's something you need to understand. Are there any combat veterans in here? Okay. The systematic nervous system activates at around 145 beats a minute. That's when you start having auditory exclusion. It's when you start having uh, tunnel vision and these different types of things that are going to happen uh, to the responding officers because that's going to be a very high stress situation. When they hear you yelling at them that I'm not the shooter, he's the shooter, they're going to have tunnel vision and if they see someone with a weapon, they may take that shot. And the last thing an officer wants to do is shoot someone that they later found out was an off-duty police officer or armed citizen trying to stop a threat. So if you have the opportunity to take out a shooter, then by no means do I think you should turn, turn your back to that. If you think you have the, the skills and the ability to take that shot, I don't, I don't you know, use your judgment on that. But do be mindful that responding law enforcement officers may view you as a threat, so, so be mindful of that. Anyone have any questions about anything? We see more and more churches. Go ahead. So typically your training is uh, to address the active shooter by two or four or whatever. Uniformed officers? They may be uniformed. They may be uh, non-uniformed. Uh, a lot of our a lot of our detectives wear, wear, wear plain clothes, but if believe you didn't believe it, they're going to respond too. So they may be uniform, they may be plain plain clothes. We traditionally, uh, when I I've been out here uh, for 13 years, and I've, I've got about 15 years in law enforcement, and everything changed after Columbine. Prior to Columbine, the idea was set a perimeter call SWAT. After Columbine, everything changed. And after that, it was officers will go in. Well, that started with you'll stand outside until at least three, but preferably four officers get on the scene, and then you'll go in. And you'll, you'll walk in this diamond formation, and you'll cover this area, and you'll cover this area. And Now, what we train our officers now is that's ideal. If you all show up on the scene at the same time, let's jump in those formations and run. But the same thing is we have eight officers that are school resource officers. They are single officers alone in those schools. So we teach them tactics to move to a threat and address threats individually. And we, our officers receive annual training in active shooter response. And we teach everything from single officer response on how to move hallways, cover doorways as they move down the hall through two, three, four, and up to a five man or five officer. Uh, formation on how they need to respond to make sure they have coverage and how they know it is. But we, within about the last two to three years, have adopted uh, what's called the alert program that uh, is something the FBI has been putting out. Uh, pretty much they're trying to have all the officers across the U.S. all use the same tactics or the same movements as they move through hallways. That way, in case, let's say, there was an active shooter at Houston High School. Well, Houston's in Germantown, but it's directly across our line. And in a situation like that, we're all going to respond. If we're all training our officers with the same tactics, you may have two Germantown and two Carville officers get on the scene at the same time. They can fall in, and in each of them is going to know what their areas of responsibility are. So we've done a lot better job in the last couple of years of getting all the officers from all the police departments in the metro area uh, using the same tactics for the <laughs> You mentioned the Richardson Tower. We, uh, mm -hmm. we were there last week, you know, training with Shelby County, Bartlett, Memphis, FBI. Mm -hmm. so. well, you had mentioned um, that uh, when you hide in place, you want to get in a corner, mm -hmm. but not opposite the door. Right. And that's for the angle of view. The, well, the let's just say, in. let's just say the active shooter just he's frustrated, can't get in that door. I'm just going to fire off some rounds in that door and move on. Mm -hmm. If you're over here in that corner or this corner, you know you're, you got the bullets coming. But if you're in the same, if you're in a corner that that door's on, you're less like, likely to get in. Okay. He may also Plug. come in a room real quick and just glance and not what we call dig the hard corner. Mm -hmm. You know, if we come in this room, the first place we're going to look is the hard corner. Because yeah. that's what we're trained to do. But your average, and of course now more and more you have 
uh, individuals that have certain levels of combat training that are doing these active shooter events. Uh, but if you have a guy that's just trying to kill as many folks as he can, he steps in a room real quick and he looks and doesn't see anybody, then he may go to the next room. Plus, if it does get to the fight, if you're in the corner on that same wall and he comes in that room and you're better, you have a better chance of surprising him, of getting to him before he notices you, mm -hmm. than you do right here in these corners where you have to get, you have to close ground to get to him. Mm -hmm. Just little things to remember. One of the things we've, uh, we covered this over at Town Hall last week and uh, the week before last, you know, we were talking about a lot of these offices now, uh, the doors have to be key locked. A lot of them don't have thumb locks on the back. You know, you, when you get your office in the morning, you unlock the door. And if it's like our offices at the police department, depending on how you turn the key, that door is either going to remain unlocked or locked. And we've encouraged businesses that have those type of doors, hey, if you're the type of person that sits in your office all day, with the door open, then what you may want to do is keep that to where it's on lock. So if you hear somebody coming down the hall, all you have to do is shut that door and it will be locked because you're not going to have the, the time or maybe even the uh, fine motor skills to, to try to lock that door if it has to be key locked. I'm sure half of them may have locked themselves out of their office the next day. <laughs> <laughs> or if you have an office and let's say your door doesn't lock, I don't know. Exactly what do you call what do you call those? Are they dead man stick? They're the the stick that has the rubber on both sides that you can put underneath the doorknob and goes on the ground. Mm -hmm. Those are good just in case you have to keep somebody out of that room if you have a if you're in an area that the door will not lock. It's just something. So people are, those are hard in offices and they're in cubicles to yeah. under your cubicle. You know, anything like it. If you can't get out, right. okay, yeah, definitely you need to hide. Uh, an ideal spot is an office, you know, but you may not have that. You know, if you if there's three or four of you or two or whatever of you in cubicles and you're underneath, you need to be prepared to fight too, you know, just in case he's coming that that way. And if you're going to get under your cubicle, uh, under the desk, you may want to try to grab the chair and pull it in to make it look like no one's there. I mean, it's, yeah. at that point, it's about concealment. <clears throat> they want to move as quickly as they can to the next person. Yeah. They want to kill as many people as they can. They're not going to spend too much time. At my desk, uh, which I sit in the cubicle, I have a an ink pen that sticks in this little dry, little weight there that holds the pen. pen. This, this weight is very easy to hold and it weighs six ounces or so. And I have practice hitting bottles like that with it. <laughs> there you go, that's your weapon right there. <laughs> if the, the fight part of this, if you come to face to face with an active shooter, they're going to kill you. They're going to shoot you. So you might as well do whatever you can to stop them. And that's what this comes down to. If, if we're in this room right now and somebody comes through that door and he's got a rifle and he has decided he wants to try to kill all of us with that rifle, and let's say we don't have weapons on, we might as well all team up together and do whatever we can do to stop them as soon as we can. Because that's just what it comes, you're not going to be able to sit there and beg and plead with this person. It's just not going to work. So the whole fight portion of this is, if you find yourself face to face with them, do whatever you have to do. You know, in this particular video, at the end it shows that guy uh, spraying the shooter in the face with the uh, fire extinguisher. In the other video that we show, at the very end, it shows a guy coming through the door and somebody knocks him over the head with the fire extinguisher. That's what I would do. I'd, I'd beat his brains in with it. Once you Whatever to, it takes. And once you have to fight, you decide to fight, you need to commit to it. You know, yeah, I would not have stopped with just spraying the guy. That's just me. You, <laughs> yeah, just commit to it. And you know, it's one of those things we tell, especially in the churches, We'll talk to the churches, uh, you know. It, it's it's awful that we even have to think about these things in our society, but unfortunately it's necessary. And, and it's become that way. And I know he's probably like me, you almost adapt this kind of, of life. You know, we my wife and I go to dinner where we go and she, she said, oh, I guess you're looking at the exits and you know, you know what, what your plan's gonna be. And it's like, well, you know, I hate to be that way, but you know, it is what it is. In the churches, we say, you know, you want to be as 
warm and inviting as you can be because you want these folks to come into your church, but at the same time, uh, if they're coming in there to kill all of you, you got to come up with a plan to stop them. And, uh, I don't know if any of you are part of details at your churches, but most of the churches now have security details in place, whether the mass congregation knows about it or not. Some of the churches we've gone to and talked to said they've actually had members of their congregations leave when they put security plans in place because they didn't like the fact that the church had a security plan to deal with these things. So, it's, but unfortunately, uh, you know, it's part of something we need to be prepared to deal with. I, I look at it as no different than uh, sitting down on an airplane and counting how many rows in front of me and how many rows behind to get to the exit. I don't want that plane to go down, but if it does, I want to know how many seats to count to get to the exit. And so that's, that's what we want everybody to do. Have a plan in place, especially at the places that you frequent. Your place of business, uh, your church, maybe social, uh, places that you go frequently, have a, have a plan in place for those places on what you're going to do if somebody comes in there. That's, that's pretty much the... Like I said, we just were trying to minimize casualties should it happen. We hope it never happens in Carnival. I will tell you, and I'm not saying this just because we're responsible for training them, our officers are prepared. They, they get a lot of training in this. You know police officers get a lot of training in something when they get tired of training in that particular area. And you'll have them, some of the, oh, we got to do active shooter training. Well, that's good because that means it's going to be muscle memory for them. And that's what they're going to revert back to uh, in those type of situations. They're going to revert back to their uh, levels of training. So I think we'll, should it happen, hopefully it won't, but uh, hopefully we'll be able to get in there and stop the threat as soon as possible. Any other questions at all? About anything else? We're wide we got six more minutes. If I get a ticket, they want to argue. <laughs> <laughs> There's a red card the lady shoved underneath the, the door. That was a casualty card, and usually you'll see that in school environments that they, they will have, it may vary from uh, district to district. But most of the schools have like red card, green card. A green card may tell the shooter, or not the shooter, but responding officers, there's people in here, but no one's injured. But red means, yes, we have people in here, somebody's injured and need medical attention. But yeah, that's, and it can vary from system to system. I will say that the, the car school do, do have a And all of our squad cars have all those plans in them as well, and the officers are responsible for knowing those manuals that are in the squad cars, which are equipped with even maps. Uh, we try to encourage our officers when they can to get out and walk the schools and be familiar with their layouts, as well as other businesses. Uh, the SROs, they know those schools like the uh, back of their hand. So luckily, if we have something happen in the school, hopefully, the, the regular patrol officers will be able to team up with that SRO as quickly as possible. Uh, you know, as far as even knowing what closets have roof access and things like that. You know, those are those are important things to know. And we also have uh, diagrams in most of the private schools. And we've got a, a really good relationship with most of our private schools out here from the law enforcement. So, what is your definition of casualty? Is that someone that's Let's go to the hospital or? It could be anything from needs medical attention. Needs medical attention. Wounded. Wounded or killed. And something has changed uh, over the last, this has been pretty recent. Uh, it used to be that your paramedics and firefighters took the stance that they were not going to enter the structure at all until the threat was neutralized. No threat. And that mindset has changed. The, the paramedics and firefighters, the fire departments nationwide pretty much as a whole have said, hey, we will enter into areas of the building that you have already secured as long as there is security detail with them. So if you've got a multi-wing building such as a school, you may have law enforcement still trying to neutralize the shooter in another area of the building. 
But if that first hallway has been cleared and we can put a security detail on that for the paramedics, we'll establish a room in there that we'll call a, a casualty collection point, what we'll call it, uh, where they can set up triage and start bringing casualties in there where the paramedics can start working. So that's changed, uh, you know, and that's asking a lot of them because they're not armed and you are putting, <coughs> putting them in there to try to work in that type of environment. Uh, that also comes down to how many law enforcement resources you have available also. One lady was in that room and told everybody in there to put furniture and stuff in front of the other door and thought they were unable to lock. They sound like Lee Race. <laughs> Anything else? <coughs> All right, well, we do appreciate the opportunity to come talk to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Appreciate it.